from 7 in the morning to 11 at night and sometimes late into the night they come and go. Wingtips almost brushy, glorious in flight, stiff and clumsy as swans on the ground. All nations, all languages. Heathrow is the busiest international airport in the world. The whole airport turns on how well, how fast and how safely aircraft can be put up and down on these runways. Heathrow small, two main runways. New York has eight, Chicago seven. The runways belong to the airport. The traffic controllers who land the jets on them, they do not. They work for the Civil Aviation Authority. They and nobody else decide how many jets can take off and land and how safely in how short a time. And so more than passenger numbers or roads or terminals, they fix the capacity of the airport and its ability to stay top of the league. There are four holding beacons around London where the jets queue. You can't escape queues to come into Heathrow. That's the London area, every blip a jet. I can remember when that was all you saw. Talk to a pilot and guessed which blip was his jet. Speak softly or you'll split his eardrums. Now the jets have identity tags. Parallel lines are the runway approach. EIN 164 is Air Lingus at 3,400 feet, 3,200 and sinking. The ground controllers take over. They can see, and if they can't, their radar can, every jet, every truck, every car that moves their side. Heathrow was the first airport in the world to have ground radar. Air Canada 857, after departure, right turn heading 220 and clear takeoff 09 right surface wind 0307. <laughs> Now, you may blow your nose without asking their permission, but not much else. Certainly not think of taking off. On those blocks, each jet's details. An ancient system, but no one has found a better one. Computers? They merely print the record. That's how the jets are handled. Efficiently, reliably. Internationally, our reputation stands high. There is a fine, professional tradition at work here. Although cuts in numbers in recruits made the 80s horrible. The country was in somewhat of a recession. Uh, the airlines themselves did not expect to be generating the level of traffic that they are at the moment. And generally speaking, uh, we didn't anticipate uh, the considerable increase in traffic that was to take place, and also the technical development of air traffic. The way I look at that is it's most unfortunate that it's happened, but there's no point in us looking backwards. It's absolutely essential that we look forwards. And two years ago, we made the decision to recruit the, the maximum number of trainee air traffic controllers that we are capable of doing, and that, in fact, is what we're doing now. Whatever people have complained about Heathrow, its buildings, its squalor, they have never, ever complained about its air traffic control. Just because traffic control's done its job doesn't mean a jet's home and dry. I mean, home, as everyone knows, is where you fall and you break your leg. And the dangers hovering around a runway range all the way from the live, wandering lobster to the literally, truly deadly. There have been two appalling accidents that Heathrow will never forget. In one case, the runway lights were out of true, and a vanguard misjudged its height, all 36 people were killed. The other time, the fire service botched a blazing 707, and five people died. It happened a long time ago, back in the 60s, but it's left its mark on the way that the runways at Heathrow are patrolled and inspected. 
at least five times a day, the deadly serious business of searching the runways for rubbish that could crash a jet while the planes are using them. Bits do fall off aircraft. The wind can catch and blow empty baggage containers across from the terminals. Plastic which blows everywhere melts and does horrid things to the engines. Birds think jets are family, turn into mints and clog the compressors. Distress calls shift them a few yards. So does firing blanks, and of course there is always real shot. But nobody has beaten the bird problem. And when the dangerous, fearless Canada geese fly over, the jets see them right away. It is a huge behind-the-scenes housekeeping job. Thousands of light bulbs to be inspected, that's what caused the vanguard crash. Surface cracks to be reported, weeds to be sprayed, and quick off the runway there's a jet about to land. That is motoring at 150 miles an hour when its wheels touch. And in those few moments when a jet is not sure of its identity, partway between man and the angels, that is the time of maximum danger. And that is where the efficient little largely unknown patrols protect them. The fire service did not come well out of the whiskey echo blaze of 68. The firemen might, the inquiry said, have done once in three years the kind of training exercise that's now down at Heathrow at least twice a week. Heathrow has its own specialized disaster team. Nowadays, training, training, training. A jet-sized cylinder's been drenched with aviation fuel. The real thing is worse. Seats burning, upholstery, people. But the firemen go inside and the spray alone stops them roasting. It's difficult work. I watched one of those hoses tangle. The risk is real. Gents have burnt not that long back at other British airports. Today, it's about as efficient as you can make it. Just suppose Heathrow continues to handle aircraft as it does now. Safely, carefully, a bit stolidly, teeny bit bureaucratically. Very, very mother knows best, and as pilots as a breed love to be mothered, you won't get any complaints from them. But the airlines and the builders of aircraft, who between them can make Red Riding Hood's wolf look like a chihuahua, they've got their own ideas about what ought to happen next, what to do with the extra millions of passengers. They've already started to put them in motion. And two or three years from now, Heathrow is going to be faced with what I believe in polite circles are called a new challenge. Heathrow and its jets have a comfortable middle-aged relationship. Same reliable old Dobbins yo-yoing up and down. Nothing unusual since jets went wide-bodied more than 20 years ago. I can remember the shock of the first hundred seaters back in the 50s. People would be frightened, they said. Too many souls at risk in one plane, they said. Well. Two or three hundreds now quite a small jet. Granddaddy of them all, and still the biggest thing on wings, is the 500 seat, 400 ton Boeing 747. A clear 70 yards from wingtip to wingtip. Nothing else around on that scale. But three years from now there will be, when British Airways, among others, gets jets with new elongated wings. The first structural change since the wide bodies. Cheap to fly unspeakably awkward to park at most terminals. Boeing is even offering a Navy-type folding wing that nobody's yet bought. But the next stage will be 80 yards from tip to tip. 18 seats abreast instead of today's 10. Two decks. 800 seats. Size on a new plateau. So for a time, it's quite likely numbers of passengers will rise sharply, while numbers of jets don't. Expanding jets have confounded the wise ones who forecast for 30 years that Heathrow was about to run out of runway and it continued like a boa constrictor to absorb all comers. But if traffic grows as forecast, even skeptics like me accept there is a finite limit, not just to Heathrow, but the Southeast Airport complex. 
On our projections, we are going to run pretty short of runway capacity in the southeast, viewing it as a system. Um, by the round about the year 2005 to the year 2010, in that, that period. How serious will it be if the day comes when you have to say, sorry brother, not another aircraft into this airport, we are saturated? It would be very sad but, uh, and uh, very expensive. Um, Heathrow is a national asset, it's the biggest international airport in the world. 30% of the people travelling through there are transferring from one plane to another. That business would clearly, very quickly, disappear over to Charles de Gaulle or Schiphol or one of the European airports. And if Heathrow does run out of runway, what do you do with the surplus jets? Because you can't leave them hovering out there in the dark. And a Heathrow-sized runway is a huge installation to cuckoo into somebody's little nest. A government working party is now working its way down a list of possible sites, but there are some most bizarre names on that list. I mean, take Bournemouth. Beautiful, beachy, bucolic, fringed by the new forest. Can you seriously see this turning into a major jet landing place? Luton's not as lovely, but it's on top of a hill, and jets do not like motoring up and down hills. It would take heroic engineering to level it off to make a big runway there. Same's true of both the sites of Bristol. They're on a slope. Now Gatwick is a major airport in its own right, and it does have room for a second runway. But you've got to dig out a hill the size of a Kielder Dam and cut off either part of Pawley Town or Crawley Industrial Estate. And that's just for starters. Now, lead in Kent is so far on the back of beyond that space is no problem. Ditto Manston. But how on earth do you get to them? Now, Stansett has always been seen as the second Heath Row. But having just spent £400 million developing it, it really is a bit late to talk about pulling a lot of it down again in order to put in another runway. But the surprise on the list is Heathrow itself. Now, we've known for decades you could put a third runway in at Heathrow. But unless I haven't been looking, this is the first time it's ever been officially acknowledged and appeared on an official list. Just watch the fur fly. Any big airport has a bittersweet relationship with its local authority. Love the work, hate the noise. And an airport as classy as Heathrow's more than an employer. It is a honeypot. Draws high-tech industry like Stockley Park. Draws officers to what was once a pretty scruffy area. We love Heathrow as the way it is. Uh, obviously there's problems associated with Heathrow. Um, especially things like the, the environmental impact of having a, the major airport um, in, this, in that part of the borough. Uh, there's problems with surface access. There's problems with noise but there's also uh, great advantages in having a very large employer and a very large business located in the borough. Well, where in the borough would a third runway fit? Here's Heathrow, the central area boxed in between the two main runways, dense as an anthill. Pretty quiet or we wouldn't have been allowed to fly over it. And going north, across one of the two main runways, heading towards the M4, over the airport boundary, Looking for room for a third runway that would put up capacity by 40 movements an hour and I have the traffic controller's word for that. Over the stretch of village and market garden, coming up now, this is where it would go. And if you still doubt me, find it on the map in official document CAP 570, as Hillingdon councillors obviously have. I don't really see the advantage of having a third runway at the airport. It will be a very unpopular airport. And certainly the destruction of the, of the local environment, is, would, 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 it would be mindless vandalism. We have examples of grade one listed buildings. We have villages in the area that would be covered by the runway. Eight and a half thousand people live there. They're very happy where they are. 
um, and they tolerate the current level of activity at the airport. A third runway would destroy those villages completely. If you've got a golden goose on your doorstep, can you really say to it, I only want you to lay an egg Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays? It's not the nature of a goose. That's certainly right. And when a goose is flying, it's not only eggs that it lays on you. It's a real poison pill, this one, and it'll be kept well out of sight until we've had the election. But what I can't understand is why the need for a third runway is being treated as such a matter of urgency, with government working groups and sub-working groups spreading alarm and anxiety among local people from Hampshire to the wider shores of Kent. When there may be a perfectly simple, cheap palliative right here in Heathrow under our noses. All this talk of a third runway, the reports, committees, inquiries, could be said to turn on one single figure. That the air traffic controllers at Heathrow cannot, will not handle more than 74 jets an hour. Where were they prepared routinely to handle 80-something? That would cope with demand for as far as it is sensible to forecast. Now that figure of 74 is starting to be challenged. Well, of course, air traffic control set an absolute limit to the, the, the number of landings that we can have on the runways. Uh, they're a very efficient and very safe organization, but the airlines make the case uh, that if they were pursuing the managerial practices of, let's say, the most efficient operations in the United States, that perhaps up to 25% more landings could take place on our runways. Much of Heathrow has consistently confounded predictions of gridlock by ingenious, energetic tweaking of various parts, including from time to time air traffic control. I want to know what's so special about today's traffic figure of 74. American airports go higher. But 74 aircraft an hour, I reckon that's about one every 50 seconds. Now, I had always understood that if you really pulled your finger out, it is possible to move an aircraft either on or off a runway once every 30 seconds. Well, that's not in the textbook that myself and my air traffic controllers operate to. No, but it's a very British textbook you're operating from. Let me go back to basics. Air traffic control is all about safety. Here at Heathrow, we've got some of the best controllers in the world. I'm quite confident about that. And therefore, to provide a safe system with the best controllers in the world, we are able to say that we can regularly operate 74 aircraft an hour. In the United Kingdom, we operate a system which is able to accommodate the traffic unless it is a thick fog situation. If the, the, the weather is not perfect, we are still able to handle that 74 aircraft movements an hour. Now, the Americans do, in certain circumstances, operate slightly differently, where they transfer the responsibility of separation on the final approach back into the cockpit so that the pilot is making the judgment of how far he needs to be behind the aircraft that's uh, obviously ahead of him on final approach. Now, broadly speaking, in the United Kingdom, we don't do that. But there are great disadvantages to the Americans doing that, because if they schedule the aircraft to the absolute maximum, assuming that there isn't a cloud in the sky and the visibility is, is perfect, and it isn't like that on the day, they end up with dramatic delays. Doesn't it hurt you, though, even a little bit, when people say, look at what these clever Americans do, they work harder, they get the aircraft in and out faster? It doesn't hurt me at all, because I do know what the American system is about. I know their strengths and weaknesses, and I think that they are aware of, of how we operate. That doesn't worry me. Supposing Airlines were prepared to accept bad weather delays here at Heathrow the same way that they do in America. Could you then technically go over to the American rate of handling aircraft? 
That is a, a very hypothetical question. I know. And but it's... Give me a hypothetical answer. I, I'll give you a hypothetical answer. It's very interesting that you said, uh, assuming that the airlines would like to do that. That's yeah. quite important. Uh, I, I would like to be uh, reassured that the airlines would like to go down that particular line. But let's go down the hypothetical road of, of them saying that uh, they would like to do that. I don't think that there would be so much benefit in doing that here at Heathrow because the weather situation is quite different here in Europe to many parts of, of the USA. I know that weather is bad from time to time in the USA, but generally speaking, I think you'll find the average of poor weather in the UK compared with many of the airports uh, in the States uh, would rather preclude doing that. And therefore, I, I really don't think that is going to be the answer to uh, runway capacity problems in the United Kingdom. But technically it would be possible. On the occasions when the weather was good, I couldn't say that it technically was not possible. It's not the way that we do the business. It's not the way that we intend to do it. And I don't actually believe the fair paying passenger would get the benefits that perhaps you think that they would. But wouldn't, some, wouldn't the bad weather delays be preferable to the misery that you're going to bring if you put a third large runway down in some leafy part of the country? To a large extent, that's for others to make that judgment. When they do, what they must weigh is the passing inconvenience of air passengers against the sinking under concrete of a sizable part of southeast England. I can't quite see how safety should be at issue. The Americans don't run dangerous airports. Traffic delays are the issue, as is the position of Heathrow as one of the finest pieces of public investment in the country. It's not a light matter to question the advice of experienced air traffic controllers. But it seems to me that the argument is about cultural differences rather than about scientific fact. For that reason alone, I would argue perhaps it should be questioned, lest we make a mistake. Next week, Mary Goldring's audit is of the aircraft carrier HMS Invincible. That's next Thursday on 4 at 9 o'clock. <laughs>